Thank you, Randy, for that word. My security team, you dropped the ball. I thought he was taking me out this morning. Guys, some things don't come but by prayer and fasting. Some of your trials, some of the tribulations that you go through, some circumstances that you're involved in right now, breakthrough won't come unless you pray and fast. Father, we just thank you this morning that your word is true. Your word is real. God, we don't go off feelings, but we go off truth. Father, we look at the encounters that we have with you as we grow day to day, week to week, month to month, year to year. We grow in you, knowing who we are and whose we are. God, that you have a place in your heart that you carved out each one of us from that place that we can go rest in, that place, God, that we can go and rest in you. And I'm afraid, Lord, we don't do that as much as we should. So I ask this morning that you would give us rest, that we would come to a place of peace this morning in our lives, in our identity. Jesus name. Amen. Yeah. Some things don't come by prayer and fasting. You know that, don't you? Randy, you've experienced that. Randy, you hit on a couple of my subjects today, and I thank the Lord for that, and we don't talk ahead of time. Just to let the Lord do what he's doing this morning. Grateful that you guys are here this morning. I want to talk about going to sleep, but I don't want you to do it yet. <laughs> Sometimes... I've seen, I've seen you. Sometimes I've seen you back here just sleeping. I don't know if you just overextended the night before and uh, didn't delegate your time well and, and uh, you're sleeping, or if you're just in the presence of God so thick that he just made you fall asleep. Either way, we're going to talk about sleeping. We're going to talk about coming to a place of rest this morning. Matthew 17, starting with verse 14. It says, when they came to the multitude, there came a certain man to him, kneeling down and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic. And he's sore vexed, and oft times he falls into the fire, and he falls into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. You ever been to that place? You ever been there when, when someone brings someone to you to pray for, for healing? Nothing happens. And Jesus answered and said to him, to them, O ye of little faith. He says, perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? And he said, bring him to me. Jesus touched him. And he was healed. Jesus touched him and he was healed. That same Jesus that touched him lives in us. And the disciples come to him privately and they ask him, why could we not cast the demons out? Why could we not do this? And Jesus' response to them was, some things don't come but by prayer and fasting. That's why we've decided to pray and fast three days before the revival, three days before the water immersion. To build your faith, to let you know God is in this. God is doing this. Ty's mom come to me this week. And if you don't know Ty, some of you might not know Ty, but he's a young, young man. He's in a wheelchair. We got him in the water last immersion, and I just saw some transformation in one of his legs or straightening out. Where it was constantly bent this way, it's straightening out. Now, if you see Ty, you'll see him. If you see him with no shirt on, his skin is all the way to the point of his heart. And you can see his heartbeat through his skin. But I want you to know God's touching him. 
His mom, out of faith, come last week and brought a bed that she can change him on in the changing room to get him changed because there's a lot that goes in the process of getting Ty ready to get in the water. And so out of faith, her and Ty both, actually Ty paid for it, but, but they bought this bed to come for anybody to use that needs to lay in it and change. Why? Because a mom knows that her son is already healed. A mom knows that her son is already healed. Because Jesus paid the price on Calvary for all of us to be healed. He paid that price. Therefore, we claim that healing. You might not see it right now, but you'll see it. Because God said he already paid the price for those things. Already paid the price for that healing. And I'm grateful for that this morning. And I want you to know that that God wants us to pray earnestly about these things, but I want you to also know that it's already been done. Okay, so when God has done something, we don't have to continue asking for the done thing. We thank him for the thing he's already done. So when thankfulness, that's where God's going to move. We don't ask him over and over and over and over for something he's already given us, but we thank him for the things that he has given us. And this morning I want to talk to you about we do not enough go into that place of rest to rest in him knowing that it's already done, knowing that it's already finished. We don't go in that place of rest enough. We're concerned about the things in life, the way life goes, all the stuff that we deal with in life, all the problems, all the trials, the tribulations, the struggles, the battles. That's our main focus, and the enemy's good about keeping us focused on those things. But those things are not the main thing. And I want you to know if you rest in the Lord this morning, if you learn to rest in him and trust him, watch how he pours out of that rest a good thing. Watch how he pours out of that rest healing, comfort, peace in the midst of the trial, in the midst of the tribulation. There was a young pastor in Tennessee just after 9-11, his church was on the grow. And they didn't have enough parking in the parking lot. And the church kept growing, and, and their parking lot kept getting thinner and thinner. So they started having to park in the streets, and then up by the highway, and they had to walk a distance to get to the church. And so the pastor said to his staff, he said, what are we going to do? How are we going to do this? They said, well, let's just go to prayer. And let's fast about this and ask God what he will do. But they're in Tennessee, and so there's mountains all around. There's a mountain right up behind them that they own, the mountain. And so they prayed and fasted for that week. And later on that week, someone come from the highway, the state highway department, and they said to them, they said, "Um, we would like to be able to purchase some of this ground back here, this mountain. And he said, what do you mean? He said, well, we'd like to come in and cut this mountain away and buy it from you. See, they had tried to do that, but they couldn't get, come up with the money because it takes a lot of money to move a mountain. But if you have the faith of a mustard seed, a mountain can be moved. If you pray and fast, a mountain can be moved. So they prayed and fast, and here comes that mustard seed through the prayer and fast and faith, and that mustard seed turned into this big old tree because this guy came and said, well, we're going to move the mountain for you, and we'll even pour you a parking lot when we're done. That really happened. That is a true story. That really happened. So that's how your faith and prayer and fasting can work in your life. It depends on what you're going to do with it, how you're going to, how you're going to handle it. You remember the woman that um, suffered an issue of blood. You remember her. And she said, only if I could only get to his garment and touch his garment, that I would be healed. She knew her faith was strong. Her faith was so strong that she knew the moment that she touched Jesus that she would be healed. Every time I go to him, that's my focus. When I touch you, I'm going to be healed. I might not see it then. I might not see it the next day. But I know when I touch you, I'm going to be healed. And so she went after it like that. And I remember my mom, before she passed away, I remember my mom, I took her to a passion place. She wasn't saved. And she decided to go to a passion play with us. And she was kind of mischievous like I am at times. And, 
And I sat on the outside aisle because I knew that Jesus would go up and down the aisle. They'd ride him up and down on the donkey, and they have all the animals coming through and the soldiers coming through, and they're in your face. And it's really fun to go to one if you've never been. I encourage you to find one and go to it. And so I had her on the outside, and, and Jesus walks by, and she reached out and grabbed his garment. And she looked at me, and she said, I touched his garment. Had no idea that she was getting ready to get a report that she had stage four cancer. But she touched his garment. After that service, she leaned over to me. She said, I asked, she said, I said that prayer, and I asked Jesus to come into my heart. What joy for a son to be able to take his mom and she get saved right there. So we went to the doctor. And they said, your mom has six months to live. The whole family's there. Said she has six months to live. I'm like, all right. She just got saved. That's a plus. She knows Jesus. That's a plus. She's dying. That's the negative in this whole situation. My only peace was that she was going to heaven. That was my peace in that situation. I rested with that peace, knowing that she, I would see her again. So here we go, and we plan all this stuff that mom wanted to do. Mom, what do you want to do? You got six months. What do you want to do? Well, I want to go on a cruise. Well, I want to do this. I want to, she wanted to see a castle. She wanted to go on a cruise. So we planned all that stuff for her, and she got to do the castle. And we get ready to go on the cruise, and, and, and um, some of the timeline might be off here, but we're getting ready to go on the cruise. And six months before mom passed away, six months before mom passed away, this is what happened. She went to the doctor, and the doctor said that she had stayed for cancer six months ago. And she went to the doctor that morning. My sister was there. And I called my sister, and I said, why haven't we not got a report about mom? And my sister said, they haven't come out yet. And she's a nurse. And I said, well, Donna, they should have already been out. It had been an hour and I said, maybe they're back there trying to decide why they told her six months ago she had cancer and now she don't have cancer. My sister said, no, that's, there's no way that can happen. I've seen too much. And guess what? Fifteen minutes later, she called me and said, they can't find cancer in mom. That's what faith does. Because I had asked mom, do you want to live? And she said, yeah. She called me one night before that, and she said, Honey, I'm in so much pain. Will you pray for me? And I said, I'll pray for you. I prayed for her that night, and she called me the next morning and said, I have no more pain. I have no more pain. I believe the Lord took that right then and, th right then and there. We got to go on the cruise, cancer-free, got to enjoy the rest of life. Two and a half years she lived and, lived and got another bat of cancer. This time it was a different kind of cancer. It was bone cancer. And I said, Mom, what do you want to do? She, kissed, she said, Can I just go meet Jesus? And I said, Yeah. If that's what you want to do. So my mom went on to meet Jesus. But this woman touched the hem of his garment. And she was healed because she had the faith. And Jesus was so mesmerized by her faith, by the greatness of her faith, that she was touched. And I'm so thankful this morning that we can touch his garment anytime, anytime, no matter what we're going through. No matter what the trial is, even if we're in jail, we can touch the garment of Christ. And I'm grateful for that this morning. Again, David was a little bitty boy. He was a small boy. Maybe about Jimmy's size. I don't know. Jimmy's pretty, pretty good, but he's smarter than I am. And so you can imagine this young boy coming up and, he's in, and fighting against this giant. Well, the thing about it is, I want you to know that David did not lose any sleep. He didn't lose no sleep because there was a giant in front of him. He knew. He's a, he went to the king. He said, listen, let me put on his armor. Let me put on your armor. Or the king actually said, uh, let me put my armor on you. And David's like, no, I don't need that because it weighed him down. I don't need that. I got God. And so you know God was behind when he flipped that rock. You know God was behind that. When he threw that stone, God directed that through the prayer. And the fasting. 
then God can do it for you. He can direct everything at the problem, at the situation, and he can eliminate it right in front of you. I believe that with my whole heart this morning. And we're going to turn, we're going to turn over in Daniel just for a little bit. I, I love Daniel. It's a great, great book. If you, has anybody ever read Daniel, like through the book of Daniel? All right, um, you should read the book of Daniel. Um, listen, the Old Testament is just as important as the New Testament because if you don't understand the Old, you're probably not going to understand the New. So get in the Old Testament, read it, study it. But in Daniel, I, I love this guy because he, he is amazing. He's got, he's got so many good attributes about him. And there was a king in the day, Nebuchadnezzar, and he was having trouble sleeping. And so he brought all the sorcerers and, and all the peace. He said, bring them all. I, I need to know what this dream is about. I need to know what's going on. I need to know the interpretation of the dream. And he brought all these people in to interpret his dream. And they come in, and he said, they said, we'll interpret your dream. Tell us the dream. And he said, no, I want you to tell me the dream. Because if I say whatever, if I tell you the dream, then you're just going to say whatever you want to say to answer. Because you know I'm going to kill you if, it don't, if you don't answer it right. So he said, you tell me what I dreamed. And they said, that's impossible. That is, that is impossible for us to do. And so he made a degree to kill all of them. And Daniel was in that lot. And they come to Daniel. And Daniel says, wait a minute. Give me a day. Give me a day. Let me go to Jesus. Let me go to God on this. Give me a day. And he went to God. And God came to him in a night vision and told him the dream and told him the interpretation of the dream. And he went to the king and he said, king, I know the dream. And he told him the dream. And he told him the interpretation of the dream. And he had favor. See, God is going to give you the responsibility of things of kings, people in high places. He's going to give you responsibility in matters of kings. Ain't that amazing? And you'll have favor in their sight. And that's what happened. Daniel had favor in their sight. And so there come a time that the Nebuchadnezzar, he, he believed in Daniel's God because he interpreted his dream. But then Nebuchadnezzar said this. He goes, he said, he created this, this image that he wanted everyone to worship. And he said, there's a certain time of the day when the music plays and all this stuff goes. I want you to bow down and worship me. And so the word went out that everyone had to worship this image. We're talking about resting in him, knowing who you are, having that rest and that peace in the midst of trials. So you have this Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're not doing what they were told to do. They're not bowing down. They're not worshiping this God. And I don't believe they would have lost sleep over at all. They were found out, and they were brought to the king, and they said, why won't you worship? And he said, we're not going to worship. He said, I'm going to give you the opportunity right now to worship this God that I've created. And they're like, well, I'm going to throw you in a fire. And they're like, well, if you throw us in a fire, if we die, we die. If we don't, we don't. But our God's still our God. We're not going to serve your God. We're not going to bow down to your God. Any God, that goes for any God in the world. We're not going to bow down to it and let it bind us. So they bound him. I mean, he was furious. I mean, his whole attitude changed for him. He was furious, and he threw them into the fire, and the people that threw him in the fire, they got burned up too. And so he throws them in the fire, and he looks in, and he sees four in the fire that are walking around. They're not even bound up anymore. And he said to his people, did I not throw, did I not throw three in there, and yet I see four, and one, one looks like the Son of God? And he told them to come out. When they come out, they didn't even smell like smoke. There, no, no hair on their head was cinched. They didn't even smell like smoke at all. Why? Because they knew who God was. They knew to have that kind of faith in, in God. And when you have that kind of faith, you'll be able to walk through a fire and come out. You'll be able to walk in a gas station and come out and not smell like smoke. I believe it this morning. If we don't rest in Him, if we don't get the proper night's rest, we can't even function right the next day. I know my wife can't. I go on a little sleep, but she needs more than I do because she's beautiful and beautiful than I am, and you have to have a little bit more sleep when you're beautiful. But I go on a little bit of sleep, 
about every night I probably get five hours a night. And that's okay because I, I get up early and pray and, and, uh, and study. But I do rest well in him. I dream a lot. God talks to me at night, takes me places in the night. I get to see things I've never saw in the night. And I'm grateful for that. So I don't complain about not getting much sleep. I just don't get a lot of sleep. But I want you to know I rest in him. I know when a trial comes, when a situation comes, I know who he is. And I know that he will solve the problem. He will answer my call. And he will bring through. He will make breakthrough in my life. Nebuchadnezzar ended up passing away. There's so much to this story. Another king came and he interpreted that dream. Then you got King Darius that came. Also tormented. But this king, this king loved Daniel. But other people didn't like him. And so they tried to plot against him. You ever had someone try to plot against you? I've been doing this for five years, this ministry for five years. Bounty hunting was, was easier, I think. Um, and I really mean that. Bounty hunting was easier. Um, I've, been, I've been, Randy, beat up, spit on, kicked on, and now chokehold. I've been through it all. There's people that hate me, and that's okay. There's people that love me, and that's okay. Because I want you to know this morning, however high they put you on a pestle, that's how far they're going to throw you down when, they, when they're done with you. Don't let anybody put you on a pestle. Don't put me on a pedestal. Because however high you take me, when you get mad at me, that's how far you're going to throw me down. Just like in a wrestling match, they take them all the way up so they can slam them all the way down. Don't put anybody on a pedestal. You're powerful people. You're powerful people. You just need to have faith and walk in the power that God has given you. So here you have Daniel again. These guys trick, tricked the king, had him write this degree up that everybody had to just pray to him and worship him for a season. And so... He wrote the decree out. When you made a law back then, a law was a law. It became a law. It stayed a law. You couldn't change that law. And so he made that law for a short period of time that everyone had to worship him. And so these guys knew that Daniel worshiped God and God alone. And so they trapped him. And, and because they tricked the king into making that law and, and persuading him to have everybody worship him, Daniel was praying to his God. He wasn't supposed to be. And they saw him, and they brought him before the king, and they said, is it true, Daniel? And he said, yes. So it grieved the heart of the king that he would have to get rid of Daniel. So they threw him in the lion's den. Now you would think that, that Daniel would be dead the next morning. But what happened is the king prayed and fasted. For Daniel. The king prayed and fasted. Watch what happens to Ty. Watch what happens. I saw Ty's face in just a moment. I seen the man that God called him to be. For a moment I saw that. I don't know if we captured it on film, but I know we saw that. Did you guys see it? We saw it just from a moment. Ty outside of this body into who he really is. So Daniel gets thrown into the lion's den. You think he got ate up by the lions. Darius comes the next morning and says, Daniel, hoping he was still alive. Daniel, are you still alive? Did your God save you? I'm going to paraphrase. Yeah, Lord. yeah, he did. I slept all night long. I slept with peace. I actually laid with the lions. It was comfortable. I laid on them. I loved on them. They loved on me. Just like big kitty cats. That's what, that's what God can do to your enemy. 
He can make, he can make us tough situation comfortable. But we have to rest in him. We have to know that he is the one that's bringing us through this trial and this tribulation. And he went down and he laid upon the lions. I'm sure it was fun. The angel was there. And he said, yeah, God sent an angel of the Lord to deliver me from the hands of the lions. And he come out. God made a way. And he will always make a way for you. He will always make a way for your life, for what you're going through, for your circumstance, for your situation. God will always make a way. Don't stay in discouragement this morning. Don't stay in a place of unrest this morning. But he has peace for you. Peace is not a feeling. Love is not even a feeling. Joy is not even a feeling. These are parts of Holy Spirit. These are parts of the fruit of the Spirit. So not feelings. Happiness is a feeling. The effects of love are feelings. But love itself is not. Peace is a person. Love is a person. Joy is a person. When Jesus spoke, peace, be still, he was speaking to a person. Peace, be still. Let's stand. I'm going to close with this. You remember Peter? Oh, Peter, how I love Peter. Peter had done been up and down all through these trials, tribulations. He already found out who he was, who his identity was in Christ. He had been through a lot of stuff at this point. He had done denied Christ and received him back, fishing, figured out that wasn't his call to go out and fish. He was supposed to fish for men. But through all this stuff, God was molding him and making him who he was supposed to be, the strong man that he was supposed to be. And you'll remember Peter was locked up in prison, chained by both hands, locked up in prison, guards all around him. And the angel of the Lord come at night in the prison cell. And I want you to know, Peter was in his cell asleep. I've been to jail before. Anybody been to jail before? Yeah, I got busted driving while suspended twice in the same week when I was a kid. They put me in jail for it. But I couldn't sleep. I couldn't rest. You know, the mats are about this thick, and the pillows are just a little bit thinner. But Peter was asleep on a rock probably, on a dirt bed with a rock as a pillow. Sound asleep. He was so grounded in God and who God is that he knew God would take care of the problem. And if God didn't take care of the problem today, he would tomorrow. And if he didn't tomorrow, he would the next day. And he knew that if they killed him, he was going to heaven to be with Jesus. So it didn't even matter to him anymore because his body wasn't his own. His life wasn't his own, but he sold out to Christ. And that's what he's asking for us this morning, to sell out to him, everything to him. So an angel will come. Peter, Peter, get up. Peter, get up. Peter! He kicks him. He thrusts him, hit him somehow. I'm just a picture, and he kicked him in the side. Get up. Peter wakes up in a daze. Breaks out of prison. Why? Because he knew his Redeemer lived. He knew who God was. He knew who to rest in. He knew where to go to have peace. He knew where to go for a problem to be solved. He didn't think about it. He just did it. Just like when a fruit grows on a tree, you don't think about 
will I be able to grow or not? It just grows. It just grows. You don't think, wow, is the tree big enough, strong enough? Is the sun bright enough? Is there enough water? It just grows. Christ wants you to just trust him so much that you just grow in him. You grow and you grow and you grow. You shed off things that are not of him. Listen, if you're walking in stuff that's not of God, if you're bickling about stuff that's not of God, get rid of it. If you have question about something in your life that you think, well, should I do this or should I not, don't do it and see if God gives it back to you. Lay it on the altar and let him give it back if he wants to give it back. But be willing to give it up for him. Be willing to change and give that thing up for him. Let's bow our heads. Father, we just thank you, Lord, this morning. This is your people this morning, God. I thank you for rest. I thank you for sleep, Lord. I'm calling upon sleep and rest with your people. That, God, they can rest in you. They can know who they are and who they are in you. They can know when a problem comes and arises that you are there to take care of it. It might not be overnight. Some of us dig some pretty deep holes. Might not be able to get out overnight, but in time, keep pressing in, keep knowing, keep believing. If you have anything that you're holding on to that's not for you, if you have anything that you're holding on to that's not of heaven, I encourage you to get rid of it now. Because some of the things you're doing right now, you're not going to do in heaven. I promise you that. And if it ain't there, it shouldn't be here. The way you talk, the way you think, the things that you do, God knows. I'm not your judge, but he is. I can only tell you what the Father says to do or not do. If you say, I'm a Christian, I'm going to tell you what the Father says. Thank you, Lord. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I encourage you to come up. Uve, will you come up right here? If anybody needs to ask Jesus in their heart, go right to Uve. He's going to pray with you. It's not about a prayer. It's about a heart change. Nothing in the Word of God says it's a certain prayer that you've got to pray to get saved. He said if you ask for forgiveness... Repent of your sin. Receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior and believe that he 